Monday evening, uh, on Monday evening, we already had a view into the theory of detecting exoplanets. Today, we are going to search for them ourselves. A meteorology, meteorology PhD, Michael Teuchner, is fascinated by astronomy and can fascinate people for astronomy. And since his encounter with Halley's comet, he has been on the search for extrasolar planets. And 14 years ago, he was successful for the first time using fairly simple methods. He was able to prove the existence of an exoplanet. Michael, please help us find more. And it's the stage is free for Michael Teusner. Thank you, and thank a very warm welcome to this talk on a topic that I find is very interesting and one that hasn't been practically uh, current in, in science for a long time. Well, it's been about 30 years, but until 30 years ago, nobody knew if other stars would actually have planets around them. And of course, a lot has happened since then. And I've been, I had. I was following this uh, from the, from a distance for a while, and around 2007, for the first time, I wondered whether I, as an amateur, would have an opportunity to uh, prove, uh, detect uh, such an exoplanet. Well, not not by not by chance. That is almost impossible. But stars that are known to have an exoplanet, whether I was be able to prove its existence and uh, with using amateur means. So, to start with, what actually is an exoplanet? Uh, very easy description. Basically, it's just a planet outside the solar system, not one of the eight planets we have, but one that circles around another star. And by now, we know quite a lot of those. Just this morning, I checked and we have 3,628 3, planetary systems that have been confirmed. And 808 of these systems have more than one planet. And when there are some very exotic things among there. Because, of course, initially we assumed that a planetary system should look very much like ours. Everything is stable and uh, small planets inside, large ones outside, but that's all, all been thrown out and uh, that has changed the way we explain uh, the generation of planets. And that applies especially to those that I as an amateur can detect easily. And by this morning, it, there are 4,904 exoplanets that have been found. And if you imagine that the first one was found in 1995, um, well, there was a fairly exotic case in 1992, a so-called Pulsar. So that was 20 years ago, uh, kind of it was found around a star corpse, as you might say. But you can find planets around all kinds of systems these days. Um, and in 1995, the first one around a regular star was discovered. And how do you find those? I think I remember that there was a talk about this. And of course, it's not so simple. If you look at a star, how do you actually know that another planet, a planet is, is circling around it and uh, orbiting around it? And uh, of course, other astronomers uh, found all kinds of intricate ways of uh, finding them through various methods. Um, so, means to actually find such an exoplanet and establish its existence. Uh, these are the methods that have been successful so far. You can broadly have divided into three categories. The first one is called dynamic detection. So, you look at things that change over time, such as orbital changes, um, the tra uh, trajectory being changed. You, and there is a very exotic method called microlensing. And that means that you have two stars in our line of sight, one very far away and one closer to us. Stars move, of course. They don't actually, they are not fixed, although the name sometimes used to suggest that. And when one star passes another, there is a gravitational lensing effect that happens. The gravitational field of the closer star uh, 
in amplifies the light of the star behind it. And if that star has planets behind it, there are some very interesting peaks in brightness that you can observe. And the light of the star behind it is, is thus amplified. And there are these interesting outliers that you can use. But the, the disadvantage of this method is that this only works once because this constellation of one star being in front of another uh, is there for a limited amount of time, just once. And photometry is the other category, so that means direct imaging, for one thing. Um, you have to have very sophisticated, uh, um, such as the eight meter mirror uh, in Chile that you have to use. You can actually image planets directly that orbit other stars, but you need specific conditions for that. And the third one that we'll be looking for are the so-called transits. And that, I think, is the only method, more or less, that amateurs, where amateurs have an opportunity to find exoplanets orbiting other stars. All the others, the dynamic, for example, methods are too specific. They will be uh, reserved to professional astronomers for a long time, and the microlensing, too. You would have to know in advance that this is happening and have to be looking at the right time. And we will be learning about transits, what they are, uh, and with that, you can repeatedly observe these systems. Uh, and what you can also see in this diagram is up to which size you can detect planets with all these methods. So you can see the pulsar method, what was used in, used in 1992. You can discover planets until less than one Earth mass. The other methods, methods don't reach as far down. Uh, microlensing yeah, we can take it down to one Earth size, but the uh, and the space telescopes we have these days, and some of you have, may have noticed that the James Webb telescope was launched on Christmas Day. Uh, that will be uh, an opportunity of observing much smaller planets, but these transit methods they take you down to planets actually smaller than our Moon if you observe from space, uh, that is. From the ground, it's not that easy. You come down to around, well, just under 10 Earth masses. And sadly, that is a fact that is uh, de determined by our Earth's atmosphere, always distorting observation. Some of you may know this. If, you be, if you're out on the road in the summer, you can see the Earth turning, you can see the, 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 the air turning and moving. And uh, that makes conditions on the ground worse. Uh, it's uh, easy to compensate that. And um, uh, that gives, uh, so pro professionals have a great advantage. Okay, so the to a transit method requires a certain constellation here. So we have a star. And from the line of sight of, of the Earth, um, this, uh, the, the planet needs to transit in front of the star. So we need to lie in the uh, in the um, project uh, uh, um, in the in the, the the plane of of the star. And if the, the when the uh, planet turns in front of the star, the the brightness of the stars gets reduced for, uh, is a slightly bit. So so the um, by this reduction of brightness um, with today's methods, and even me as a as a as amateur can um, uh, can measure the. Um, the, the transit here. So we know this from the, our solar system as well. Maybe a couple of you have also uh, um, observed uh, uh, transits like that. So, for example, here's the uh, ve uh, the transit of Ven Venus from uh, June 2012, and uh, this this is how it looked from Earth. And so, um, during this event, uh, for a couple of hours, the the amount of light is uh, much smaller. So we know, uh, of course, that uh, in our solar system, that only works for the inner planets, Venus and uh, um, uh, Mercury and um, uh, Mercury, and uh, since Mercury is much much smaller than than Venus, um, uh, you, you see that the effect is very very small as well. So we can, it's possible today with our uh, um, with uh, our um, modern methods, but the effect is very small. So um, so if you look at the um, the profile of these transits here. At, uh, the relationship between the size of the star and the um, uh, size of the corresponding planet. So if you, if you have this uh, effect of 0 0.12, we see a uh, um, um, reduction in the uh, in the brightness of just 2.7 percent. So the whole thing tells us that us, we as uh, hobbyists can uh, 
uh, are o uh, could only be able to measure the transit of very large planets, uh, relatively large planets. And also, the, um, the, 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 the duration of the transit um, depends on uh, uh, on how far away the planet is from the star. And so those tran transiting planets uh, we can observe as amateurs right now. Um, it's, um, so we, have, we see something like one to four days uh, uh, this time here. And um, so for, for, for some of these, uh, these the planets we can measure, uh, one year for this planet is something like one or two days on Earth. So, um, so for this observ observation, uh, this observation, I need to um, need to um, observe the whole transit. So if the transit takes something like four hours, I need to observe at least six hours during the during the night, uh, the time before, the time after, and for that, um, the sky has to be clear all the time. Um, I have to be ready all the time. So that's the good. So so here here an example. This is how the uh, Jupiter would look like t uh, um, transiting uh, uh, past the Sun. From very far away, so you'd see this. You'd see this. Uh, um, this uh, um, uh, lowering of the brightness for uh, for a few hours, and that's it. And this is how this would look from really far away. You see this this dot here, um, which uh, uh, gets a little less bright over over some time. But that's all. You don't see any only changes in, in brightness here. So uh, uh, if you do the actual measurement, you're doing lots and lots and lots of photos here. With a certain uh, with a certain exposure and uh, uh, and with a with a uh, with a certain uh, uh, software uh, software packet that I'm going to present later on, we um, we then analyze the data here uh, on whether the the star got less bright over the time or not. And so let's have a look at a couple of real transit of uh, brightness uh, brightness plots here. So this is from Hubble from the space uh, from the uh, space telescope. You see lots and lots of dots for individual measure measurements, individual samples here, and you see how this um, the the brightness goes that goes down here. So minimum minimum is here, and then when the planet um, pa pa passes away from the from the, from that away, the the brightness goes up again. So the um, so um, so that it doesn't look at a, a, a cornery uh, here depends on where the planet passes the passes the star here. So the 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 further we are at the uh, the um the um the the um, um, the exterior areas of the of the star, the um the less square like this um uh, this curve looks like. So um. So and what it, what also might might notice is that the stars seem to be less bright uh, in the outer areas than in right in the in, in the center here. So we also see this here. So this gives us the the, the brightness curve here. So we see HD two nine four five nine B is what the name of the planet. So this was just the ID of the star here, um, according to some star catalog. Because we know lots and lots of them, and most of them are. Are, are so dark that it's impossible to to watch them with uh, with your bare eye. So uh, and so the so the first the first planet the first exoplanet you see on a star gets the letter B and um, that the uh, this animation then um, gets extended to the other the other. So, so you have B C and D with the um, uh, um, in the time of their uh, de uh, their detection. So this has nothing to do with the distance between the star and the planet, but uh, it's just the order in which we detected those. So uh, if so you, see, you don't you don't see a very big effect here, and the reason uh, reason for that is that this uh, this uh, planet here is very very um very very small. So the the whole effect is is uh, and the whole difference in brightness is also very very um very um very small and noisy. Whereas here on a very large planet, you see that the uh, there's a lot less noise in the signal here, and the effect is much bigger, much easier to see. So I ask myself, can I do this as an, as an amateur for myself, as a hobbyist? So I don't have any space telescope, unfortunately, and I don't even have 35 meter uh, meter mirror. Um, so no no amateur, no hobbyist has this kind of equipment here. So uh, um, so as an 
uh, as a as obvious, I, I depend on the weather conditions. I, I, I only have a small one here. So that's what I had. I had a, a small refractor um, with uh, 60 millimeters diameter, 370 millimeters of uh, focus. And so back then when I tried this, uh, the digital cameras were not as good as they were today. So back then I had a, a, DM, a DMK camera, a, an 8-bit uh, uh, industrial webcam, and black and white, 8-bit resolution. So, what you could also do with that, so you need a little bit of equipment, of course. Um, you see, you need an astrom astronomical mount um, for for your refractor, um, which points to points to the polar star and uh, compensates for for the rotation of of Earth, so that the um, the uh, stars uh, always uh, appears at the same position on, on, on your picture. And of course, a, um, a computer with a software to, uh, to, uh, to um, analyze the, the, the pictures there. And today, most, uh, most amateurs, most hobbies have this kind of equipment. And it's not that ex not expensive, actually. It's just well, maybe a few, a few hundred euros uh, is what, what gets you equipment to actually um, measure the first transit. So this is the first one that I did, was the transit of the exoplanet HD uh, 189773b. I, uh, I, uh, I observed this on uh, October 2008. You see this here, and this is and the whole transit took like uh, took about two hours here. And so, as I said before, the planets that can be detected by amateurs need to be very, very large. They need to let need to need to um, um, occur large large parts of the stars. So, what we call them hot Jupiters. Uh, Jupiter, Jupiters, uh, so planets of the size of Jupiter or larger in a very um, uh, small. Um, um, very uh, sh small, um, um, very, very close to their stars. So what I'm saying here is that I'm doing lots and lots of uh, photos here. So yeah, you do not overexposure that one. So if you see this, this is how the um, how the, um, the, the 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 brightest profile should look like. And so this is kind of uh, looks like a bit of normal distribution here. And if you overexposure, then the um, uh, the the sensor goes into saturation. You see some flatness here. In in my example with eight bits, uh, that would be 256. And you wouldn't see any um, uh, any um, change at all, e uh, even uh, even during the transit here. So I could, couldn't really detect the transit here. You may you may see some changes there, but that, that's definitely not enough to um, to, uh, to to measure. Um, so so, uh, so you don't, but you do, uh, so it, it, it's okay um, to uh, to uh, get slightly out of focus. This uh, this might even make 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 things simpler here. And um, so this is the my equipment from uh, from 14. 14 years ago, so so you could think that I knew, knew and just have to observe the brightness of the stars, but that's not enough, and it doesn't even work because because we have uh, uh, turbulences in in our atmosphere, and by that the uh, the brightness of the star varies so much, it's so noisy that I couldn't really observe the transit of the star. So the relative photometry. So what we do instead is what we call relative photometry. So we compare the brightness of our star and the uh, some neighboring stars and compare uh, the the relative brightness between between those uh, those uh, two. And so we can uh, just uh, measure the the brightness of one star from uh, from uh, from where we are uh, from from Earth, and there's some uh, some uh, dedicated software for that. So the optimal exposure would be something like two or three uh, minutes, uh, because this uh, uh, this um, averages out um, turbulences and uh, uh, other noise from uh, short short term noise, and. Even if if uh, the star is not very uh, not very bright, I'm getting you not enough signal from uh, from that one. What I also need to know is when does do these kinds of transits happen? And for that, you have the Exoplanet Transit Database, great website that you can uh, where you can find for each evening what transits there are going to be at your location as well. I've entered Hamburg as a location here, and. Just by tonight, there are 30 transits that you could observe in theory. 
And there's one here uh, where the transit will take about 97 minutes. Star brightness is 12.8 magnitudes. That's 200, 300 times uh, darker than you can see with the naked eye. But there are some examples where 2 to 3 percent of the light are actually blocked by the transit. Given good weather, that would be a good observation target. Um, and it's far, uh, high enough above the horizon too. So you can pick one for yourself in there, maybe after the talk. And uh, what you also need to detect an exoplanet like this is, of course, you need to uh, evaluate the data uh, and, and look at the planets. And you have uh, this extrasolar planets encyclopedia giving you all the details on the known exoplanets, uh, their orbital periods and things like that. And, uh, and I'll just show you how it looks like at my home. So I've got this. Um, it looks fairly technical, my setup at home here. Uh, you don't even have to be next to the telescope anymore. I uh, use TeamViewer or something to control it. Uh, it's all become a bit more comfortable. This is not the six, but 10 centimeter telescope, a specific astronomy camera attached to it. There's a huge selection here, starting from, say, around 100 euros. And you need, of course, uh, a tool to take the actual images, the APT is a soft used. And of course, you have to follow the, the movement and control that. Uh, as you observe a star, uh, you have to follow its movement across the night star sky to uh, uh, virtually keep it constant, uh, moving, moving less than, say, two, three pixels. And of course, then to process it, you need something like Astro Image J, that is the free software that the professionals also use. And I'll show that to you right now uh, with a actually real series, data series I took. And you can find tutorials on this on YouTube. Links will be coming up in a later, on a later slide. This is what the software looks like as you open it. Uh, I have prepared this for you already. This is uh, a run of the software, and uh, it first has to load the uh, images I took. I prepared a few of those, and these have to be in the astronomical format called FIT. But the software you use to store these images will always save it in that format. So that's the format you should choose. So I'll open this. I only need one image. It tells me that there are 143 images in that file. And you should always uh, click an option that is called Use Virtual Stack, because uh, uh, otherwise, uh, if you don't do that, your computing power will be overused. We'll be seeing a few windows opening up, and that gives you the actual image. You can see several stars. Um, so I, I chose the uh, resolution. I should, should choose, chose the zoom. So the next question is, what is the actual star I'm looking for? And that's the one. I'm clicking on that, and you see this kind of target icon here. At the end, the data within that circle are what will be evaluated, and everything else will become the background signal that will be subtracted, as it were. And to do the averaging process, now I'm picking the analyze item and uh, um, choose the uh, profiling item. And with that profile, the software will tell me the optimal radius for distinguishing the actual data from the background. Uh, close this. And now I need to do this relative photometry, meaning click on other stars for comparison to detect the actual transit. So I'm using the symbol with this here, and I've preset a few things. Uh, you can uh, learn from the tutorials what all these settings mean. So I'm going to now click on Place Apertures. 
a purchase and of course uh, and first i need to click on the star and then i uh, click on a similar star for comparison and i'll pick these and uh, add this one too then maybe that's one's a bit too bright and i can see the brightnesses and maybe i can deselect one of them too if, if, and now i need to click the right mouse key and that will open several windows at once and the processing will then take a bit and uh, i can watch it as it happens and i will be explaining what the tutorials say it uh, explain it as well and there are forums that you can use for understanding the software too so i selected uh, for all these plot settings, I can make several settings. I can say when the transit started, and I've I just uh, I've sorted out and all the data is in the file already, so I know which time, which image belongs to which time. I can tell it when the transit started. That's just after 11 p.m. and it's then transformed into a decimal representation also the time it ended it was a 77 minute event and the exoplanet is called trace 3b that's another hot jupiter uh, and you can see these lines are getting drawn and the blue uh, dots are data is data coming from the actual images and i already told this after when the transit started which i could take from the exoplanet transit database that's this red line uh, so that's the theoretical the predicted start of the transit and the predicted end of it and i can also tell it which of the data items to choose for the transit because I'm telling it not to use the actual transit because certain fits or trends are uh, also applied and, and taken out. So I'm clicking with the left button on one of these items here and I can mark the dots to use. So on the ones on, on the left here and um, we'll be doing it the very same uh, on the other side. And what I then can say with these fit parameters, the software is built in such a way that it will automatically apply transit profiles to the measurement. And uh, for that, I have to know what the orbital period of the planet is, which I took from the exoplanet database. And in that case, it's 1.3 days, which I've pasted into this dialog here. And uh, what you also have to specify is what the physical properties of this planet are or to actually detect the physical properties, sorry, I can tell it the size of the star, which is also found in the uh, on the website. So this, this circle here representing a hot Jupiter, that's uh, 0 0.924 solar masses, something I also input here. And then, then there are several data models that I used to uh, actually determine the size of the star and uh, that can be deduced and you can see the transit very well now uh, and you can see that the observed data actually fits the prediction uh, brightness reduction of two to three percent and you can see that the um, uh, measured items are, uh, have some variance, some statistical variations, and you can see uh, that there are some items now coming up that, uh, where the brightness is increasing again. And as you look down, you can actually see various parameters on the planet that are determined. So you can see various fits that are applied. You can actually, you have to learn what that means by looking at the documentation or tutorials. And the orbital data determined from that fit uh, are now becoming visible. So distance to the star, um, so the um, <clears throat> so 6.4 star diameters is the minimum distance of that planet. You compare that to the solar system. <clears throat> and what you see also is the size of the planet. 
Dann sieht man hier 1,4-facher Jupiter-Durchmesser. And you see 1.4 Jupiter diameters is what was calculated from my measurements. And what you also see is the orbital inclination, the, the angle at which we are looking at the orbit is not 90 degrees. So we're not looking at the orbit from the top. Uh, it's about 87 degrees, actually. And actually, um, uh, a remark coming from the control room, the screen share has stopped. No, actually, I stopped the screen share. I'm very sorry to... But, I, but I, I finished with the screen share. So you see that the actual view would have been 1.3 Jupiter radii and uh, the inclination would have been 81.4 degrees. So actually my measurements are quite close to the expected values. Uh, so going back to my slides, even as an amateur, um, I can actually find physical properties of exoplanets. And uh, if you want to take a screenshot, uh, I'm happy to thank you. First, enthusiastic feedback. More than 300 people in the chat. Please imagine a room of 300 people who are giving you a, a resounding applause. I'm trying to communicate this. Sadly, virtually, um, this is not very really easy to convey, but imagine. It should be possible to imagine this. So, huge thank you. And we have many questions. Um, did the end still, was the end in the video? The control room knows and we'll see. I hope so. But the slides sadly were not visible in the end, I've just been told. Anyway, the first question is one you asked at the very end here. Uh, did, actually, did actually amateurs discover a new exoplanet? I just can just say that, right? Um, yes, amateurs did build a searching system using several telescopes, and yes, they did find an exoplanet. Um, and you yourself, 14 years ago? No, I didn't discover that one. I only confirm known transits. And, uh, And that is important too, because the professional astronomers cannot track all those exoplanets that they discovered, because the time allotted on these professional telescopes is very limited for all these various research programs that there are. And you can, um, I can check when the transit happened and, and confirm whether it happened at the expected time. And you can actually see things changing, shifting slightly, uh, transits happening 10 minutes earlier than predicted from the first observations that the professionals did. So that way, you can actually correct the orbital data. But if you had been the very first one... If you by chance would have been the, uh, the first one to, uh, to find that, then... But so, but there's really a huge, uh, huge, uh, um, uh, huge chance there. So a very, oh, very small uh, chance of getting that. So, uh, uh, so um, uh, taking a photo at exactly the right time and uh, really look, look at. Uh, so if I do a lot of photos here at, and analyze all the stars in that one uh, for exoplanets, but the the uh, likelihood is very, very small for that because uh, you'd only see transits coming from the uh, from the very, very large transit. Otherwise, I couldn't observe this as an as an amateur but uh, yeah it's but i mean the, the, fen the phenomenon is there um, as unlikely as winning the lottery is there's always someone who wins the lottery so so it i think it would be possible another question can you can you differentiate between a planet being very large and close to uh, close to the uh, its star or um, very large and uh, and further than that uh, further away so So can you can you differentiate that? Um, yes, because of the 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the the duration of the transit. 
um, because the further the planet is away, the um, longer the uh, the um, the longer it takes for the uh, for the next transit to happen. So, so if you, for example, look at the Earth, uh, you could only observe in a transit of Earth just once every year, and so this uh, this search programs are uh, um, uh, most of what what they found would be planets very close uh, very close to the uh, to the star. So there's also the question: uh, How often are uh, our um, uh, um, solar systems like ours? And this hard, this is very hard to observe because Neptune, the 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 the, um, the orbit time is something like um, I think uh, um, um, 800 years. So we couldn't really observe that. So would it be helpful for um, for exoplanet hunters um, 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 if they uh, would? Uh, if they would be distributed all over Earth and looking at looking at a transit, so with the idea that that you would get a higher resolution of that one, like, similar with uh, what ha happens with radio uh, telescope, and so with those visual uh, visual observations, you would need to um, you need to connect them and analyze them absolutely live. Um, There's very difficult methods used by uh, by professional uh, um, uh, professionals here, and that's not even possible for amateurs here. So this is uh, this is way too uh, way too complex. So next question: How do you make a difference between between a transit and uh, um, um, uh, and a um, um, a, um, a star a star that uh, uh, um, that just changes its brightness on its own? So so that's an important question. So, so um, of the the uh, variable stars, we know their we know their profiles for quite a long quite a long long time so um, so the so the the the, 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 bri the bri uh, brightness profiles of these transits are um, are very typical very uh, very specific so they and in addition um, um, it doesn't help uh, it you, you just can't uh, um, observe one planet for just one transit. so you have to you would have to um, uh, observe several transits um, for the uh, uh, to be sure that uh, you have observed an actual uh, transit here so it it would be at least one year of this uh, this specific planet to, uh, for you can be sure here so this is a very very exciting uh, topic here so thank you for this uh, bridge to the philosophical question so you as a excellent exo planet hunter how do you um how do you um, feel the um, uh, um, sorry the uh, uh, the this uh, the humiliate the, the anthroposophical humiliation so um, uh, feeling just as a as a uh, small tiny human in a huge universe so first of all it's well even 30 years ago um you we we just uh, um we weren't sure whether there are any exoplanets at all so 1992 was the first time to actually observe that and what we know uh, now that is that having a planet is not that unique in the versages having a planetary system is not that one so um, well so far we know that we the um, that uh, we are still the only known inhabited planet but um, so the the whole thing is is very exciting so we learn more and more about uh, um, planets everywhere about uh, solar systems everywhere and so the this uh, all of this all of the the research there all of these observations there even um increase this feeling of uh, of humanity being being something special of earth being something special so um also so um i mean uh, and the uh, the um, the tech uh, always improves there china for example has a uh, has a uh, with um, um a telescope with a nine, 39 meters uh, mirror so um the the observation observations we can make are getting better and better so maybe we, maybe we get a chance to um to find other Inhabited planets or planets with li live on that. Looking at at, uh, at cl uh, chlorophyll, looking at this uh, the uh, the spectrums of uh, these planets. So the professionals will look at places where all these amateurs um, would be guessing would be uh, uh, that there might be something. 
So there have been lots and lots. Uh, well, so lots and lots of stars uh, have been looked uh, for the uh, for the Goldilocks zone. Um, so we know lots of planets in that zone, and this would be candidates for um, for actually searching for life. But on the other hand, we wouldn't even know how, how life could look like on other planets. We have just we have a sample size of one here, so so is we have a very very limited um, point of view. So we got the first batch of of questions from the, from the batch. So we we got some answers for that. Those. I'll do a uh, short uh, a short bridge to the uh, next one, but I am inviting all um, uh, everyone here to go to the question answer um, answers um, uh, room here, so we can extend the the um, discussion. So thank you very much.